Seriousness, the, 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 the first thing I want to say to all you guys is uh, thank you. I mean, you know, I, I think we're always get focused on what we can do at the federal level and kind of all this stuff. But the, the stuff happens, like rubber hits the road with the actions you guys take. I mean, that's, that's, that's where it really is. So uh, I just want to say thank you. You know, you know these, these type of events are uh, especially important to me because I think this is, this is where a lot of the social innovation that we're seeing uh, happens. And, and it's one of the big things is, in many places you guys are ahead of the government. Uh, you guys are the ones leading the charge, trying try to figure things out. For me personally, uh, the, what, in my role in, in the conversations of why do we need a chief data scientist is uh, there's just, you're, like, if you just hear the ideas, like it's all about this data and what we can do. And if, if you look back five years ago, it's, uh, it's really incredible that people didn't even think really, they were like, maybe there's some city data. I mean, at that time, like a hackathon like this would be like, hey, can we make our city website work on a mobile device? Like, <laughs> is that too much to ask? And, it was probably a device that was more like a BlackBerry than, than a, like a high-res phone. So, so it's, a, it's kind of incredible how much has changed. The other thing that's there is we're, sort of see, we're now seeing that this is a, these aren't experiments anymore. These are, this, this is reality. Like this tech really works. And one of the things that we have to figure out is how do we make the benefits of this technology work for everyone, for all of America? Uh, just like as we're seeing people talking about, hey, let's do all this cool things that we can do in healthcare with the mobile devices, well, how do we make sure that works for everyone? Uh, so that's really, really critical. So we, when we were talking about this role, we came up with a, a mission, uh, and we, we really used that to stress test things. And uh, when we, we really came down to it and started talking about using the mission to actually have conversation about what's most important, what we realized was we needed a mission statement that really defined what is going to be the long-term arc of this role. Uh, and, and especially when you're the first person in the role, you, your job is to make sure there's a second. I mean, that's <laughs> that's how you know you define success. And, and, and the, the big component of it there was uh, uh, to responsibly unleash the power of data for the benefit of all Americans. Uh, that And there's kind of a couple words that are important there. Responsibly, what does responsibly mean? What is that, what is that supposed to be? Uh, and then the, the other part is, for all of America, it's all Americans. And, and a lot of times, when you think about this data, whose data is this? It's it's our data. It's it's our data together. So we should be able to use that data and transform it into something more effective. And that's, in fact, what we call data-driven government. We've, we've spent a lot of time talking about what a data-driven organization is, and we've seen companies massively benefit from that transformation. I mean, astonishing and uh, how much benefit they, they've done, uh, not just for, for for themselves, but for overall American competitiveness. So how do we take some of those lessons and apply it back to ourselves, especially at the community organizing level? Like nonprofits, the whole thing. And one of those things, the definitions that we say is the data-driven organization, you collect data, uh, or a data-driven government, you collect data, you do it in a responsible way, and then what do you use that data for? You open it back up to the public, so the public can do a few things, as well as internally you can do a few things. You can iterate and combine it with other data sets to figure out how to make efficiencies. You can take those data sets and figure out how to build new products, things that, that people hadn't thought of before, gain insights, wisdom. Uh, and you're doing it for a, a, a very specific reason, bettering society and providing security. And security is a social fabric. And, and one of the things that's really important here that I don't think we we really have gotten our handle around is uh, we're really good about talking about the cracks in the social, in our social fabric, and how people fall in those cracks. And, and you guys, just community actually, you guys know this better than anyone else. I, I mean, it's. But what happens when you have latency between a database? That's a digital crack that somebody's falling in between. Latency being one database updates another database, but it does it really slowly. Maybe it waits till the next day, and somebody's, you know, food stamps. Somebody's deportation status, something stuck in the middle there, just because the computer system didn't, didn't get updated. That is a new type of digital crack. That type of crack in our social fabric can't be obviously seen because it's sitting inside code. And it's not always obvious because it's, like it's, it's just slow. Access to information is a digital crack. Not having access to this updated information. 
talking about things about like, hey, where's where are those neighborhoods? Where are the neighborhoods that, that have a notion of, of things that can't really be fully captured in, in, a, in a typical data set? How do we discover that? How do we start having that conversation? Like, what does that even mean? Like, the people who are going to figure this out is not going to be some data scientist sitting back in the back room. It's going to be you guys combined directly. And, and to convince you, like, you know, we're trying some of these really different things now. So one of the things the president just announced in Camden, New Jersey, is what we call the Police Data Initiative. And this was started, this was started in, in, in Washington as part of the 21st Century Police Task Force. But it wasn't started by something where the president said, hey, you know what, guys? I, I think you guys should really have a police data initiative. It's, it's like all good things come up that way, right? Uh, no. What happened was two presidential innovation fellows, these are people who apply to come back into the government and spend time in agencies. They're in Department of Energy, uh, Clarence Woodwell and Denise Ross. And they paired up with a former person in uh, the chief technology office, uh, and, and Lynn Overman. She's a former federal prosecutor, used to be at the Department of Justice also. And they said, you know what? we got to do something about this. This is insane. And uh, data should, technology should do something. So they started calling police chiefs. They said, hey, would you be willing to come to the White House and um, spend some time with us? And I didn't know they were using my name to say that I was going to send the invitations later, but <laughs> well played by them. <laughs> and, and there's one secret thing that the White House can only do really one thing, is like if you call somebody, they pick up your phone. <laughs> that's, that's like the White House secret power. And so they all, they all said they, they wanted to show up. And so we got uh, 21 different police chiefs to come to town uh, with data scientists, technologists, uh, community organizer, organizers. We got them in a room. So you got the dress blues, you got the hoodies, you got everything going on, and you know it's a, it's a little awkward to meeting because it's a very tough, hard, sensitive project and concept. Like, what would you open up? How could we have transparency? If we really believe consistency is transparency over time, how are you going to give us data to show us that we have that consistency? What can be done? What are, what are you, how are you going to make sure that we feel comfortable with these things? And you know, we one of the most important lessons that we took, which is a lesson that you guys know, it comes from you guys, is instead of having a no conversation, we said we're going to have a how conversation, and then we're going to decide whether we should or shouldn't do this. Let's figure out the lines afterwards. Because after we start going through that, we start having the how conversation. We're like, you know what? That's not that bad. Maybe that's okay. And as a result, we've got now 24 cities and more joining. Uh, that have committed to opening up over 101 data sets that had not been accessible before. And some of the things that we've also seen, and thanks to Code for America doing this, is realizing, you know what, the police chiefs actually have a real problem. It's technology. They have vendor solutions and they need help. They need help to get the data out of these systems so that they can give it up. Even if they want to provide this data, they don't know how to provide it. It's not like they just say, click save and then say export. It doesn't, it's unfortunately, it doesn't work that easily. So they're struggling with that. And here is the most screwed up thing. Here's literally the most screwed up thing. Some of these solutions want to charge you $90,000 to get the data out. What's $90,000? That's a playground. That's a playground in your community. That is unacceptable for data that the citizens own. That is, that is what we mean when we say to unleash the data. We have to take that data back and give it back to the community so you can see it. <clears throat> so we're starting on our way. We're nowhere done. We've got to get going there. Same thing with uh, electronic medical records. One of the things we're also focused on is precision medicine. Uh, this is the idea of we can sequence genome. We've got all these medical records. How do we bring all that data together? How do we bring it together so that we're going to see the next generation of, uh, of uh, insights? How do we make sure that we, you know, the level of, uh, it, you know, we see this with cancer, that we have very specific treatments that are now designed. How do we make sure that's, that's true? And it more, most importantly, how do we make sure it's true for every American? Because right now we have an incredible, uh, uh, I mean, let's just call a spade a spade. We have incredible distribution issues with, med uh, with medical, uh, with access to health care. Uh, and the third area that we're focused on is open data, my data. One of the things about what does my data mean? Well. You know, why can't you just access your birth certificate? But why, why not? Why can't you access your school records easily? I mean, you can get all this other stuff easily. And you think about that for a second. Like most people are like, yeah, well, I already keep mine. I got mine. Yeah, you ever talk to a foster kid? Like they need this all the time. This is every day. 
even the military kids moving around. If they don't keep tight, keep all those records together, it's real pain. You're in a disaster. House burns down. City floods. I mean, we have climate change. They don't need my anger management version of me. It's like, <laughs> I mean, it's true. You know, this president says like, you know, he, he's not a scientist, but he knows some scientists. Yeah, so I'm a weather scientist. <laughs> I spent that's what my career was based on is meteorology. So it's happening. And so we're talking about how do we bring climate data and health data together? But you're in that disaster situation, how do you get, why should you have to wait in line? We've got a mobile phone anyway, shouldn't you be able to go get access to your data without going to 15 different departments to get your own stuff? Like, this is not sort of, sort of super theoretical thing. This is, government is supposed to work for you. Right? We've got to figure out how to make that happen. So we've been putting a, uh, a team together and we have that team People like Jonathan Goldman, uh, Jason Goldman, who's coming in from Twitter and media. He's now the chief digital officer for uh, the US. Evan Cook just joined from Twilio. He's a co-founder uh, over there. And Twilio is the equivalent to the second largest carrier now. They touch 95% of all phones in America, apparently. So when we talk about APIs, we go, hey, just ask Evan. <laughs> he kind of knows. Uh, we have Ed, Ed uh, Felton. Ed is the guy who showed uh, that the, the online, uh, all, the, all the electronic voting records could be hacked uh, uh, and showed that, how to, that you need to really do a lot different job of securing them. And it's been very outspoken on, on encryption issues. And so when you think about it, if you're gonna have to deal with encryption issues, how, who's the best person in the world? It's Ed. Yeah, we're like, it's, people are like, DJ, what do you think? I'm like, go ask Ed. That's the world's best. So we're very committed to doing that. And part of that is to make sure that we're able to empower those that are in the government to, to, to take on these challenges, because many of the best are already in there. They are in these roles. We just have to give them an avenue to do what they want to do. They want to build the right system. They want to do these things. And, and part of this is we're starting to figure this out at the city level as well and the state level, but we need to do so much more at the local level. And this is why uh, uh, what you guys are doing today is, is so important, because these problems and like one of the things we're talking about is like what would be a city SDK? Software development, like the question of like, how do you have these templates for uh, uh, for the data and all all these different things? We shouldn't have to reinvent it every city to city. You know, we have thousands of cities. Every single one of them is an experiment in technology. It's experiment in policies. We need to figure out is how do we use all those experiments of what's working and what's not, and share that information to each other, and then just take the best of that. When we just start adopting that across each other, we'll have our modern day barn raising. And that's what we call when we say uh, innovation nation. Let's really take that innovation nation, we'll start empowering ourselves. That's, that's, uh, that's a big thing to us. Uh, the other one is how do we get more uh, data DNA into the entire federal system as well as society? And there's no reason that as we're training people uh, we shouldn't give them increased data skills, knowing that there's such a demand. Uh, a lot of people don't know. I started my career in community college uh, 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 because I didn't do very well in math in high school. <laughs> Not doing well is probably an overstatement. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, yeah, first year of school, suspended, kicked out uh, of my math class, and read my rights uh, first on the first year. Uh, and luckily, community college turned it around for me. So that's why I'm such a such a strong supporter of the president's vision on community college. So how do we get data training in the community colleges? What's that mean? Uh, how do we get that analytics capacity, those skills? Uh, if we really believe that we're about to embark on an innovation nation, then we got to get those skills to everybody. Like we cannot allow this app to be separate technologies, separate systems, a class base on, on technologies. That is that is not who we are as Americans. Uh, and then there's something that, that uh, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter says that I think is, is really important, is that as a country, we are best when we engage directly in the hard dialogue. And he has a whole bunch of case studies that kind of show like what happens when we, when we really engage and when we don't. Uh, but we always end up on the right side of the equation when we're willing to engage directly in the hard dialogue. And I think technology is one of those forums where we literally come together and make that, make that happen. Uh, I could go on and on about this because this stuff is so, um, it's, I think it's just so important to, to the stuff that uh, we do. 
I'm just glad that I was able to get my travel approved to come out here. <laughs> you think it'd be like just pressing a button? It's, it's we're getting there. David recorded from Facebook is now running a, a IT for the White House and uh, uh, making a game changer, making our tools and systems better. Uh, but uh, how do we talk about anything? Product design, some of the stuff we're seeing, the that initiative, uh, precision medicine, whatever, whatever is is most useful to you guys. But you guys are the the, the all stars. Any questions? Yeah, just shout them out. So the Police Data Initiative is the idea that we said, we, uh, so separation between federal and state issues. Right? So we can't say, like, hey, you guys all have to give data this way, or this is a standard. So what we're doing is we're bringing 24 of the most progressive police chief and jurisdictions together to start opening up data and start sharing it in a common place so everyone can start looking at it uh, to hope to evolve to a set of standards that we say, hey, this is what looks right, as well as starting to share technologies that will help get the data out of these systems into a unified environment, a place where they can uh, share it. Uh, we have five, six maybe, uh, data scientists from University of Chicago, uh, data science for good group. Uh, that are uh, going to go actually in to work with uh, police commissioners uh, and, and start studying that. We're going to start looking at a lot of the questions around body cameras from a technological perspective. Uh, because one of the ones that people don't always realize is, you know, it, uh, under extreme budget pressure, how do we think about where do you, how do you deploy these technologies? Because uh, it, it is terabytes of data, it's not petabytes of data yet, but uh, the cost of just storing that data is you know for a bootstrapped uh, police department is extremely uh, tough to make trade-offs there, and, and we really think about it for the data for three groups. First is a citizen, that is number one. That's the that's the number one person we're we're thinking about. Number two, the uh, police chief. Uh, sorry, not the police, the officer, the actual officer, the person who's actually on the line. You know, because equally, you know, you think about data. It's like, well, why aren't we giving them data to to know if they're Subjective bias, or you know, uh, uh, um, just you know, they're just not seeing the bias. Why aren't we giving back the data? Increase training, give them feedback. You're like, why is it in a video game you get so many detailed feedbacks about your statistics? Like, if anybody play like an Xbox game and you got like Halo, and you're like, look, here's your hit rate, and here's all the, like, it's like all this thing. You talk to a kid, and they're like, oh yes, here's how we think about the statistics. And you're like, wait, <laughs> what about real life? <laughs> So why don't we give that feedback about how you're doing and performing that same way? Uh, how do we how do we start using data to inform an officer what is really going on in the neighborhood, like the type of place where they're going to go? Let's let's give them let's give them an advantage to help use data to help them police. Uh, and then also the the police chief and the mayor, because we know they're under extraordinary budget pressure. So how do we take that data and start using it for that uh, for for them? Uh, uh, on the uh, body cameras, there's a ton of other stuff because it's there's privacy issues. You know, a kid just happens to be being you know on the side of the street, and you can see their full image. We don't know how to automatically blur out something like that. It's just we just don't know how to do it technically yet. So a lot of questions there. A uh, lot of good, a lot of challenges, and and this is one where we're going to bring a lot of people together to try to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the idea. That's it, effectively. Now, there's, uh, there's a lot of cities who already have that going. Uh, we want to try to. Uh, this is like, what data should be open? It turns out when we actually look at the data sets, these 101 data sets that they're talking about, these are really like they tell a lot. They tell an extraordinary uh, 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 portion of the story, uh, and uh, I, I think it'll give us ex deep, deep insight to some of the things that are happening. And by the way, the stuff that uh, you're seeing, the, the Department of Justice. Uh, with uh, uh, in the Ferguson report of the statistics as well as what's in the Cincinnati uh, uh, agreement. That level of fidelity of data is the direction that this is really heading in. The, the number one challenge, I'll tell you at the end of the day, is it's not the agreements to open up the data. It's the, the difficulty is the data is locked up in the system and somebody needs to build a generic type of technology layer that's going to get the data out to, 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 to open it up. 
and these are, you know, like you're talking about some old systems. And so one of the things we did is for Camden is uh, we just put it, well, for lack of a better word, we just called it an elite tech team uh, and just kind of got the best people that we knew. And we said, hey, would you be willing to spend a few days uh, in there to help figure out stuff? And, you know, these are systems like that they're barely able to keep them up. And, uh, and they just kind of go in and they're like, hey, well, here's here, what about this, 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 this. And so now we have kind of a concrete plan of things we could try to start getting that data out of there and how to post it. Because some of the other stuff that turns out, the data is bad from the start, not necessarily just because of nefarious purposes, but because of user experience and how you actually record the data. Like if you have to scroll a whole lot to get to a page where you actually fill out the stuff, it doesn't get filled out. Uh, and then there's this problem of like, you know, we've heard costs like $20,000 to move the button <laughs> around. Uh, uh, you know, just kind of crazy, crazy stuff. And then this this problem that we're uh, that I'm describing in, in this ca case is very similar to what we see with medical records. For those anybody that's actually trying to ever get, get access to their <coughs> medical records, and this is why we have what's called meaningful use one, two, and three. And we have to do a lot more to allow you to uh, to just be able to download your medical. It's your data. It's your medical data. Why can't you just download it? Uh, and that's things that people call blue button. But wait, it's a start. I don't want to make a claim like checkbox is done. In fact, what we're doing is we're doubling down on it by putting that that team that I just mentioned, the Clarence, uh, Denise, and Lynn. We're actually repurposing all of them, so they are 100% on this, as well as like Roy Austin, who heads up a big portion of this at the Domestic Policy Council, uh, and um, the president is getting very regular updates on this. Yeah. As we begin to bring that data. Data literacy in the schools. What do you think is the most important thing, or where, uh, what's the most important thing you can bring to students to teach them more about? Uh, number one thing would be ethics. Uh, data ethics. Just because you can with data doesn't mean you should. Uh, uh, I think there's, there's a general notion with technology of how do you think about responsibility of, of data. I mean, you guys are all taking the step here. If you're taking responsibility for your own your own city, like we have to get people to understand that that. The notion of ethics, civic responsibility, those types of things. That, that's that's my number one thing. You know, like if we, I, I'm I'm guilty of this. Like I built, you know, people say don't go build another photo sharing app. I, I did, <laughs> right? And then, <laughs> it didn't do so well. <laughs> but but I spent time doing that. And, and you know what? I, I feel I feel a hell of a lot better every day doing the work that I get to do now. Uh, and I'd love for people to know, like when we train people, they shouldn't just be looking at. You know, hey, let me try to figure out some analysis on some system, or let me try to figure out how to, you know, do something very narrow with data. You know, our, the classic one is just the joke is Jeff Hammerbacher, who's uh, uh, I guess both of us get credit for coining the term data scientist. You know, he's he had a thing that said, you know, the best minds of our generation are going to uh, figuring out how to click on ads more. Uh, now. Jeff Hammerbacher works as a research scientist at uh, at Cedar Sinai on cancer. Uh, I'm in, uh, working on this stuff in government and healthcare. Uh, Daniel Tunklin, who is uh, 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 led the data team also at, at LinkedIn for a long time, is just not insured healthcare. Monica Rudigati, who's now the VP of product, or uh, does uh, all the data for Jawbone and uh, tries to figure out healthcare. So actually, our, 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 I would argue our best minds in data science are now going to work on problems in society. The first people who jumped in, first respond. You know, the first responses were in Nepal. Data scientists and technologists, because they started looking at all the data coming off sensors, starting to figure out like, hey, how do we piece this together? Where's the safe water? Where do we think the like the, the areas are going to have the biggest impact? First people figuring stuff out for the people who before people could get on the ground and going. Like that is astonishing that that's happening now. That we rely on people like that, which is great. It's amazing. That we can have that. Same true for Ebola. It's only going to become true. Every disaster response team will have an embedded data scientist with them. They have to have context. They have to have that. But you put the pair them up, it's going to happen. Yeah. How large is your staff? Can you share this with the audience? And how's it organized? How do you manage it? Sure. Um, so uh, uh, the team, the White House is an interesting way to think about it. So it's a little, it's a little convoluted. So there are three people on my team. Uh, uh, the White House is an exceptionally small team. If you kind of look at like some of these big things, you'd be like, wow, all those people do that. Uh, but you have, you have your extended team within the agencies. 
in all sorts of different areas. So you often bring lots of people who have a vested interest to, to do so. And one of the biggest things is you want to figure out how this is also part of an agency because that becomes part of their mission and that's how things are institutionalized over the long horizon and transition uh, uh, as government continues to evolve, presidencies change, et cetera, secretaries change. And so that's why that's so important. Uh, the way it is, is uh, I, I report to Megan Smith, who's the CTO, who reports to the president. Uh, we effectively all take our orders from just one person. And so we don't really dilly-dally around uh, issues. Uh, and I, I can't tell, like, this is the most data-driven president we have ever had. I mean, I can't, I can't emphasize enough how focused he is on, on, on these things and utilizing data to, to, to make sure it benefits all of America. I mean, you guys are better than anyone else. Like, he's this hometown turf. So uh, it's, it's real. It, it's very real. Uh, our prioritization, very, we work very aggressively on it. Number one is healthcare. Number two is open data, my data efforts. Number three is uh, uh, social justice, including community policing, data discrimination, all of those type of aspects. Uh, and number four is uh, uh, increasing data DNA across uh, across the country. Uh, but it's, we, we are ruthlessly focused on our, our prioritization. There's, uh, there's lots of time left. A lot of people ask, like, there's not much time left. Uh, for that, I just encourage people to check out the last Super Bowl. Uh, <laughs> and the president actually has, he has a very concrete line. He says, he, this is a quote, he says, remarkable things happen in, in the fourth quarter. Uh, and so we are committed, fully committed, like we, to, 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 to sprinting right to the very end of the moment when, when uh, the law things change. Uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> as far as the initiatives regarding um, accessing your own personal data, what is the conversation around you know, identity theft and things with uh, intent or stalking? Yeah, uh, cybersecurity, malicious intent, all of those things, obviously very much in the news right now. Uh, so w one of the things that is there is uh, we are putting together, we're, we're, you, we're very focused on this, and one of the challenges that is out there is, as we're seeing is uh, there's some very sophisticated players out there. I mean, exceptionally sophisticated. And we're also seeing that attack on one system where there's a breach actually has cascading impact to many other systems because that information's out. It may not just be that you didn't change your password, but other sensitive information is being used to attack another system. Uh, and so we have a real kind of domino effect issue that we gotta get, get a handle on. Uh, and we we got to get a lot lot better at this. And, and uh, right now, I'm not staying so focused on those things because I, like we have other people who are just like that is a 10x full time job, and so they're they're staying focused on that. Uh, and I, I I know some of the people in there that are working on that, uh, and they are exceptional. And what we have to do is there's a big thing of figuring out what to do, and then getting it implemented in time. And, and that's one of the big things that has to happen is uh, getting it uh, done in time. And, and part of this is also going to be how do we talk, like in, in your communities, you need to be talking about what is good internet hygiene. Like, you know, keeping either, you know, like what is a good password, two-factor authentication, uh, all of these things, like making sure people know what phishing is, all these things, because people know how to target. Like people are taking advantage of people who, who as, as more and more people start to get uh, know about this stuff, you start targeting the people who don't know. Uh, underserved communities, elderly, uh, we, have to, we, have to, we have to reach all of them as, as well. It is literally, uh, it is astonishing how, how, uh, how much work we have to, have to do overall. Uh, because you have an evolving attacker. People are they're changing all the time. Yes? Uh, I'd like you to uh, speak to the intersection of uh, human capital and data innovation. One thing that seems to be institutionalized is the industry's lack of inclusion and diversity in creating talent. And it seems like that um, in order to deploy any real innovation, we're going to need people to do something. Yeah. But if we look at the crisis in STEM education, there's a correlation that relates to 
uh, data innovation and data scientists. So if we're not producing a diversity of people in the room with the context to ask the appropriate questions, we continue to get maybe what we look like are you know, just very boneheaded moves because the lack of uh, us being aware of the, uh, the weakness in, in, in human capital development. Yeah. So is, is there any intersection back to the man who's given the orders about how some of this plays out to impact the creation of human capital in support of uh, the future of data innovation? So, so we should just call out straight up that we have a problem in diversity in tech. I mean, let's just, we, we know it. We, it's, it's, it's no longer, do we have a question? No, a, we, have a, we have a problem, we have a problem. And so the, what we, the, the thing is, what do we do about it now? So the, the first is you're raising, uh, I think, two, there's two really important parts in this. The, the first is um, what happens when technology is used to marginalize people, right? So, so technology can be, inadvertently used to marginalize people because of access or, or uh, you know, an algorithm just favors something and you don't even realize it. Uh, and so how do, you, how do you make sure that what we call data discrimination doesn't happen uh, and either innocent or nefarious? Uh, and that is something that was called out in the big data report and something that we are, we are, we are actively working on. The, the, and there's questions of policy, legislation, there's like tons of stuff in, in, in here. And there's, there's also, we also have to be very careful because if we, if we dial too far, we're also going to undercut a lot of potential innovation where the, the, the innovation layer is literally that force multiplier to bring up society as well. So we need to be, we, we need to figure out how to balance that. Uh, and so that's very active ongoing. Uh, on the STEM training component, Oh, let me ask say one more thing about this. I was like, you know, one of the things about data is oftentimes we think data is supposed to be cold and it's kind of like, you know, very AI fearing type thing. You know, like, you know, if those of you that use type ahead, you know, I don't think the type ahead's going to take over the world anytime soon. <laughs> right, it just can't even really get my stuff correct. So the, the, the thing that's there is, you know, we're human for a reason. So we should always think about how do we use data to augment us, to help us make faster decisions, more efficient decisions, more informed decisions? But we never should take the human out of the loop. Like the human must remain at the center. In fact, one of the central things of precision medicine is to make sure the patient participant is at the center of the conversation. Uh, it must be at the table. Uh, it is so important to, to do. Uh, on the STEM training component, this is, uh, I only get to touch one component of STEM right now, which is the data science component. And the only reason for that is it's just literally hours in the day. I wish I could, if I did STEM, I would do only STEM. Like there's so much to do there. Uh, my part is how do we get ready for the next generation for data science? Uh, Megan Smith, my colleague who's this uh, CTO, she's spending a lot of her time on STEM. And uh, uh, Megan has taught, I, I encourage you to check out the talks and stuff, because we're, we're ruthlessly focused on how do we get more women, how do we get underserved minorities, and uh, build everything, everything in, into tech. Uh, and one of those things is, is what does it mean to have the appropriate training programs? How do we get people to have opportunities? And so there's, you'll be hearing much more about this coming up soon, real soon, uh, uh, but we have to do a lot more uh, of the direct inclusion into, these, into this, this layer. Everywhere from the companies to training to government, uh, I've always been fortunate that uh, the teams that I've built have uh, actually had very good uh, uh, gender diversity. We have not had good ethnic diversity, uh, and we haven't figured out how to how to crack that yet. Uh, and you know, we have a, my own teams. My personal rule is like you get three people of a particular type, and then the rest takes care of itself. Like it always fixes itself. So how do you get enough of those different groups of people? Uh, like however they want to define themselves uh, and, and get them to, to have opportunity. Uh, it's a, can't give you more concrete part answers just yet because stuff is, stuff is in, the, in the works. But it is, we've gotten very clear mandate to, to address it directly. Yeah. I'm sorry. What is that? 
What is the <laughs> I really appreciate it. Uh, next, so you guys are doing an, uh, you have some really great programs that are actually centralized. Mike Bracken, who is the chief data officer uh, in, in the UK government, has it, it, been focusing much more of that, and that, that is spanning across, much more across Europe, uh, is, is how that's been taking off. And now it's getting centralized, sort of that idea is getting more localized into the each, each uh, uh, places. I don't know about Ireland specifically, but, but uh, sometimes they offer drafts for some things, but they don't think that's the way you put like a drought of water. Yeah, exactly. So if you want to like say as trying to come here to drop the water. Yep. What is the best way of the drop? Right, so so the, the the classic there's there's kind of a few funding mechanisms to get things moving. The the uh, one that's the most overlooked is small business administration. It's, uh, the, like the SBIR, the small business small business innovative research grants. Uh, those type of things are, are kind of there's like a very structured format for those in the different areas. There's a granting agencies. If it's more like R and D, you would go to NIH or or uh, Commerce or uh, NSF, National Science Foundation, uh, those type of groups, and, and then there's venture, uh, and the venture groups have a whole kind of model that is private sector uh, where that's happening. And then there's actually a lot that's actually happening uh, uh, by uh, uh, smaller side uh, from like agent uh, like 501c3s like uh, Arnold Foundation and groups like that where we're seeing other things. That's, those are kind of the best ones. There's not kind of a clear one where you can say, oh great, I got that, and uh, there's a pipe to test things. Uh, but the good thing about tech is you can just build something and try it and start getting it out there with really low cost nowadays. Yeah. I also don't want to steal like all your time today, too. You guys are actually doing the more important work. This is like perfect because you get to do my homework. Um, <laughs> I'm working with a group at Google called the Black Tech Mecca, and essentially what we want to do is uh, diversify STEM by creating a culture um, that makes it exciting, incorporating aspects of fashion, art, entertainment, yeah. things that the kids are actually naturally into, and then show them the work behind it and do workforce development as a core and stick. Uh, we were inspired by the Becoming a Man program that Barack uh, touted and the uh, Office of Civic Innovation. The issue is our data set where we can show that these programs have the specific amount of influence necessary to actually get the bodies in the chairs. Because people have the, the offices, they have the computers, they're willing to do the code. We just can't get the kids excited. Yeah. But we already know the entertainment people can get them excited, but we have to be able to quantify and show it through some sort of index and you're the perfect person to help me do my homework. <laughs> So when I walk in the office on Monday, I can say I asked you. Uh, all right. Uh, wow. <laughs> Woo! No pressure. Uh, that will get me in trouble. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the Office of Civic in, uh, Innovation, uh, David Wilkinson, who, who's running that team over at, in the Domestic Policy Council, is outstanding. You know, here's here's one of the, the like what you're describing is this fall off gap between what is how do we get people excited about stuff and then figure out like what does that mean to the job transition so like they're actually learning stuff. But one of the best places where we're doing this right now is uh, uh, there's actually two. One is mathematics. Like if you go to some of these mathematics fairs, like people are playing these games and they're doing some very sophisticated math and they have no idea. And then you have this kind of classic thing is people, the parents like, do your math homework and it's like the exact like worst form of like trying to get somebody excited about math. You're like, it's like all stick, no carrot. Uh, uh, it's like the worst form of it. Uh, and so we have to figure out how to make it fun. Uh, 
the uh, Hour of Code uh, has done a really great job of kind of combining with uh, uh, things like Frozen and, and, and uh, you know, showing like how you can make coding fun. Uh, we're seeing a lot more of that. I mean, Minecraft has been amazing. For anybody who has a kid like Minecraft, you're just like, whoa. It's like, you it's like getting between a lion and food. It's like if you get in between like a kid and the Minecraft. It's like you don't want to be stuck there. It, it, and so like, how do we do that but more, make it more, more uh, relevant? Like Khan Academy is a good experiment there too. The measurement function is what, something that I think we have to be extremely careful with and dogmatic about because one we can't we've had this typical like ah there's no way to measure it so we don't try right <laughs> but that can't be an answer but we also know that so much of this can't be captured so how do we kind of create a, a, a good kind of model I think the only way that we're going to do it is by creating lots and lots of tests and just trying one thing after another some of it's going to be some performance based type things, like how you're doing. Some of it's just going to be some kind of cleverness kind of type, you know, problems, like what, how did you do over here? How did you do over here? Um, these type things. Uh, when I teach math, one of the things I'm looking for is not your ability to execute on the problem. I'm looking at, so can you see something more unique? So like with a, a four-year-old, I'm interested if they're trying to copy a pattern, do they realize that they can actually create symmetry? Like can they use, like by folding the piece of paper, could they get the, the answer more quickly than like, oh, well, I'm going to do this n different times. Like I'm looking for that kind of, I want the students to get that kind of grasp. Uh, now, how do you measure that? <laughs> I don't think we know. I think there's a lot of hypotheses. Uh, now, one thing I, I want to make sure that we don't lose that you did mention is the arts. Uh, because I think we have, we have, you know, this whole kind of question of putting things like music below the line when it's, it's like the first thing you cut. But how do we make sure that it's cool to do music and math and all these things as, as cool it is to do sports? Like, look at, look at what Glee. Suddenly, like, being part of the, like, <laughs> the Glee club is, like, cool and sexy. Like, that's not what it was like when I was there. <laughs> and so, so, like, how do we get, like, people to, to, like, to realize, like, yeah, that's a good thing to be doing. Yeah, uh, uh, and so... And how do we bring, like, let's, let's, we should fundamentally figure out how does a day of a school day doesn't feel like chunk to chunk to chunk to chunk. It should feel like, I went to school and I learned. Now, did I learn about music or math? Does it matter? Did I learn about chemistry or physics? Does it matter? I learned. Yeah, because last time I checked, I didn't get, like, a problem where I'm like, hey, you know what? You need to go solve this problem. So I'm like, so is this a chemistry problem? Or is this a reading lit problem? No, it's, it's a problem. Uh, so I, I would love us to, to, to get more more to that type of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I would just do one more. And then I want you guys to get back to the, like, the real stuff. I just, um, hi. Um, thank you for speaking. I just more so had a comment. Um, I'm a user experience designer. And what I think, you know, just addressing this point about, and I was talking to her about this unit, it is about the journey, right? So that's something to keep in mind, is like knowing what that journey is and, and bringing them to where they want to go. We know where they want to go, but if you don't, I mean, it's like using a bad website, like you will not use that website if it's bad, you know, it's bad. So kids will not get into things that have a bad experience, like, a, you know, a bumpy experience. You need to make that journey a smooth one. And that does take an iterative process of experimenting and finding out what works and what doesn't. But I just more so had a comment than a question. You, you're, I think the journey is so important and to get to where we want to go. Here, here. I mean, so, so I just want that what, what you're saying about user experience, this is literally what's going, when we talk about innovation nation is going to bring people up, is going to be the user experience. It is the, it is the way you interact with a machine, is the way you interact with society, is the way you interact with people. That's, that's user experience all throughout. Like whether we're going to call it user-centric design or just <coughs> making stuff. <laughs> what, what, but let's make it awesome. Let's make it so it's seamless, so that, that that we actually love doing something. Like, why should we take love off the table? And it's like, yeah, I really actually enjoyed that. That felt good. Like, we, like, 
that's that's not something that should be that that we should think is uh, something we can't like, going and doing it having a government service should not feel like this kind of painful terrible thing it should it should feel it should be rewarding empowering it should teach us maybe it gives us more opportunity to, to talk about things think about other things yeah why don't we you guys need to get back to you so. I'm happy to hang out though Uh, yes, uh, my contact information is D, this is like the world's worst email, uh, D-P-A-T-I-L, like I is in Italy, L is in Larry, at O-S-T-P dot E-O-P dot gov. So Office for Science, Technology, Policy, and then Executive Office of President is what those, those are. Uh, I, I will warn you, I am really bad with email. Uh, Twitter tends. I'm, I'm at DJ44. Uh, it tends to be a little bit faster. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, easier way to get a hold of me. Yeah. Thank you. Man. Yeah.